there's this narrative that this was a David and Goliath story. It was all of these hedge funds like yours against the people, and the people won. I'll put it this way. If a five-year-old walked into this room right now, I could probably kick his ass. If a thousand five-year-olds walked in here, they could probably take me down. Just being honest about it. Is that a David versus Goliath story? Uh, you know, no. Something happened this January that no one expected. It was a little bit of like an internet revolution. We were team human, team normal, rant, regular guy. It's united capitalists. It's like this focal point, a paradigm shift in everything that's gone on for the last few hundred years on Wall Street. Socialists. And if there was a small chance that I could have a direct impact on ruining some billionaire's life, I wanted in on it. And YouTubers. So how much did you make? Um, 40,000-ish. The idea that an internet forum could take a failing company and by collectively investing in it, or to use the parlance, taking it to the moon, take on the hedge funds and win seemed impossible. 11, Houston, if that's not the earth, we're in trouble. But was this really a people's revolution? This is not a David versus Goliath story, but more of a Goliath versus Goliath story. The GameStop story is the story of its investors, and we'll be telling it through the experiences of three amateurs in California who all buy and sell their shares using trading apps. Gavin May, a 19-year-old YouTube star, parkour enthusiast, and amateur online trading guru. Do you sometimes wonder why people listen to a 19-year-old who's been trading for like six months? Yeah, no, totally. Um, that's definitely a very valid question. John Motta, who works for a homeless charity, he blames big finance for some of LA's housing problems. Have you ever bought any shares before? No. First time? First time. And Casper and Matt, who run a social media marketing company. I'm a gambling guy, and I really believed in the power of, of memes, and I put my money where my mouth is. A year ago, GameStop, to many, was a business slowly dying. It sells physical games at an actual shop, and many on Wall Street thought that that business model wasn't just outdated, it was prehistoric, a business doomed to fail. Its share price this time last year was around the $3 mark. Over the summer, though, a few investors began to proselytize about GameStop. People like the then obscure YouTuber Keith Gill, aka Roaring Kitty. Many think it's a foolish investment, but everyone's wrong. They argued that far from being dead in the water, GameStop in fact had potential. GameStop is an established, uniquely positioned player in a thriving $150 billion gaming industry. One group in particular was listening an internet message board called Wall Street Bets. So could you just describe to someone who's never been on Wall Street Bets, just kind of like what, roughly what the culture is? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to do it without, um, without using offensive terms, but it is very juvenile, very self-consciously absurdist. Their favorite thing to do is something called loss porn, where you share your biggest losses and everyone would be like, hey man, good job. Like, you lost a million bucks, good job, man. Sort of the nature of the sub is like riskier bets. I can't tell like what's a meme and what isn't, but all those meme posts are feeding into um, the larger goal of getting as many people to buy stocks as possible. Slowly, GameStop started to get a buzz, and gradually, the share price began to tick up. This is the first official close above 14, so cheers to that shit. So I first heard about GameStop through um, the subreddit, Wall Street Bets. I think the first time I bought in was late November to early December. I think the, the stock price was around $16 back then. GameStop's share price had attracted the attention of another kind of investor, short sellers. Hedge funds that thought GameStop was overpriced. Hedge funds 
like Citron Capital, founded and run by this man, Andrew Left. Yeah, I've known GameStop for a long time. To me, it looked like they were following the blockbuster video path. And then all of a sudden, we found out in the December, while the industry was actually up, video game industry had their best month ever, December of 2020, GameStop actually had a bad quarter, or a, a bad month. They were declining. And that was supposed to be their savior month. And that's why I started to short the stock. Left's hedge fund was now one of the many hedge funds that were shorting GameStop. Essentially, they were betting that the share price would fall. If it did, they'd make money. But that had also been noticed by people on Wall Street bets. GameStop happened to be one of the names that was most frequently shorted. They'd worked out that if GameStop's share price went up, hedge funds would lose money. And many users on the platform came up with a theory that went like this. If enough of us were to buy it together in conjunction, could we create a short squeeze which would force some of these hedge funds who are betting against GameStop to close out their position by buying GameStop back and therefore pushing the price of GameStop even higher. Wall Street Bets is a forum on the San Francisco-based Reddit, one of the biggest social media companies in the world. And watching on was its chief executive and founder, Steve Huffman. I've known about Wall Street Bets for years. Um, Wall Street Bets is, in fact, uh, one of my guilty pleasures on Reddit. Was there a point where you were like, huh, this is a bigger story than I thought? On Wall Street Bets, there's often a, a couple of um, stocks or companies that have their attention. And so over the years, it's been Tesla, it's been Virgin Galactic, it's been Blackberry. And so in my mind, I, I'm just browsing Reddit and GameStop, okay, yeah. The GameStop's there, they're, got their infatuation right now. So I was actually a little late to the party because I didn't realize that Reddit had leaked into the real world again. Um, and so it was, I think, really at the, the takeoff of the mania where it's like, okay, this is, this is a, a bigger one. By mid-January, the price of GameStop shares was nearly $30, a tenfold increase from eight months before. It was about to go stratospheric. I got the champagne. Cheers. Congratulations. Look at this shit. Look at this shit. 60%. When did you start thinking, oh dear, something's happening here? Well, when I went, to, I went to go do like a Twitter live feed and I think like 150,000 people went to sign on in the first few minutes. And you remember that line from Jaws, I think I need a bigger boat. <laughs> it's, it's about this point when GameStop shares truly took off. Ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. Ah. I remember that day, it went from, I think we opened at like $39 and the peak of the day was like 76. Yeah, 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 dude, watching this chart gives me, like, heart problems, I swear to God. We both bought between, what, $70 and $80 around there. GameStop had another wild day of trading. It was ridiculous. We're texting each other all night. There was a couple mornings where... A couple where we of really up. good mornings, yeah. yeah. GameStop isn't stopping. Fueled by social media, the video game company... All the money you had in the world was doubled yeah. in this crazy few hours. Completely crazy, yeah. And, and I mean, and that was only like, that was only like the first of like the five day craziness. GameStop was going to the moon. The price was going up and up and up. There's more and more activity, more and more news, more and more attention. The video game retailer hit a high of $380 a share. GameStop was now in uncharted waters. Its share price had increased by a hundred times since March. We have GameStop hitting $300 and $350. And there was even an after hours session once the market was closed, but you know, especially large institutions can still trade where it hit $450. I bought in around 3.30, I think the first share. So I was a, I was a late comer. Word got out that there was a good chance that the hedge funds and billionaires that um, got greedy and bought those enormous uh, short positions were going to be completely ruined over this. And so even if there was a small chance that I could have a direct impact on ruining some billionaire's life, I wanted in on it. Steve Huffman was looking on. He had the power to switch Wall Street bets off. Was there any pressure on you to maybe 
lock down Wall Street bets? Um, we've faced that question, like that literal question. Is, is there pressure? Should you do something? But our, our um, motivation or what we were trying to do, our duty in that situation was actually the opposite, to keep Wall Street bets online. So we did take, a, a, you know, of course, a closer look here. But really, we were making sure that the community didn't break because a lot of people were coming to Reddit for that experience. With Reddit's keeping Wall Street bets up, it now seemed unstoppable. Can I ask how much you lost in total? No, I, mean, I think the fund was down approximately, I don't even know, 18%, 18% possibly. How much is that in cash terms? I won't discuss that. That figure is certainly in the millions and likely the tens of millions. But then something happened. One of the biggest trading apps used by amateur investors called Robinhood, based here near San Francisco, made a crucial decision. It and other trading apps were happy for people to sell GameStop shares, but they decided to restrict people from buying them. That really took the, the wind out of the sails for the whole movement, because now the majority of the people can't even buy the stock. And obviously, you know, a lot of people started freaking out a little bit. Robin Hood's reason? Well, their chief executive testified to Congress that they'd run out of capital to meet deposit requirements. Or in other words, so they claimed, they were running out of money. We don't answer to hedge funds. We serve the millions of small investors who use our platform every day to invest. And then it basically started falling back down to earth. And first it fell back to the sort of 200s and then 100s. The clue to Robin Hood's branding is in the name. A trading app that self-reported MO was to democratize trading had to some protected the rich. No one cared, like, and it, and it happened right in front of your face. They blatantly did it and no one can say anything. So that's when we were thinking, okay, we should, you know, we give brands and companies a voice all the time. Let's try giving the little guy a voice for something that we really are passionate about decided to fly a plane over Robin Hood's offices in the Bay Area. We did. Yes. I think, yeah, Robin Hood catching the brunt of this is, told, like, they created that irony for themselves. They, they, they cashed in on the brand image of democratizing trading and making it so that the, the average man can participate and play in this much bigger game that typically they, you know, they've been closed out of. And as soon as the little guy starts to actually, like, win some chips at the table, then they have to shut down the game. One of the things that came up time and time again when talking to amateur investors is how much they believe that the financial systems were rigged to benefit the rich. And much of that seemed to stem from the 2008 financial crash. Well, nothing was learned from 2008. No one was held accountable. The banks were bailed out. You know, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't afford uh, housing at that point. You know, I crashed on a friend's couch. You can kind of see on the post, like, the difference between the memes and the jokes and the person who's like, you know, this is for my immigrant parents. This is for the people who ruined my dad's business in 2008. There's a lot of earnest posts on there still. It's not just socialists who think that. Jordan Belfort was a vocal supporter of Wall Street bets. His financial crimes were characterized in the film The Wolf of Wall Street. And that's a real wolf. That is a real, real live wolf, wolf that was there at the time. He went to prison, but claims now to be reformed. When I got indicted and went to jail, never once did it occur to me that I was innocent. Seriously, I never felt like I was persecuted. I got what I deserved. I trusted the institutions that put me away in jail. I did my time and I got out and I rebuilt my life. Most people today don't trust the institutions that are essentially metting out justice. They watched what happened in 2008 and we all saw the movie The Big Short, at least many of us did. At the end, there's a funny scene, funny, where they say, and all the bad guys went to jail. And they're like, ha just kidding. No one went to jail. And we laugh or at least smirk because we know it's true, but in our stomach, it's not right. We know it and it erodes the trust of the people. So I think you find a lot of people right now, they just, they know it's not right. 
By early February, the share price of GameStop was about a tenth of its market high. And on the way down, people lost a lot of money. Casper's shares were at one point worth around $100,000. He sold a few, but he hung on to most of them, he says, out of principle. On the way down, his shares decreased in value by more than $60,000. I could have made a little bit of money, but I think the experience, I think some people are gonna be mad that I'm saying this, but I think the experience was, was worth it. You know, it's, I don't really get too attached to the gains until, until I've, I've sold. John Motta bought high. He says he only invested what he could afford to lose. But many others bought high, thinking GameStop would go to the moon and lost big. And I do think that there were many who strongly believed that they could drive the price up and it would just stay there and it would stay up forever. And the only thing I can think of that functions that way has been Bitcoin. GameStop didn't behave like Bitcoin though, and many people holding onto their shares were being egged on by other Reddit users, whilst others were selling. Those are definitely people trying to get everyone whipped into a frenzy so that they can cash out. So you're constantly saying that you're taking it to the moon, while at the same time yourself trying to divest. But it's easy to forget that there's really millions of people on here that aren't commenting. All they have is a username and they just joined it and they're just reading along making their own decisions. Reddit is like the definition of confirmation bias because the way the platform works is that content gets served to you based on how many upvotes it gets. So people have to agree with you for your content to reach the front page. So that means you're only gonna hear from the people who are saying what people wanna hear. You're only gonna hear from the people who are diamond handing it. Right, so if someone said, do you know what guys, I think we should sell up now. Yeah, no one's gonna like it. No one's gonna like it. So, so it's just the more extreme funny stuff that gets upvoted and then you get that false bias. That's yeah. so interesting. Yep. Exactly. I asked Reddit's boss whether he felt any responsibility for those who lost out. I think any trade any trade, not just a, a, a risky one like, an, an, like that Wall Street Bets is known for, has risk, but it also has opportunity. And, and I, I think it's, it's important that individuals have that opportunity. Like, I don't think we as a society should be so paternal to say that, well, this group is smart enough to make these decisions, but this group, you know, we should keep them out. And nobody goes to Wall Street Bets uh, thinking that this is a a safe place to spend money. GameStop has been characterized as a Wall Street bets versus Wall Street battle. But we didn't interview anyone who thought it was as simple as that. I suppose the question is, to what extent was this a people's revolution? Well, it was certainly started as a people's revolution. And then I'm sure it would be only logical that any shrewd large investor would say, hmm, look what they're doing. Let's jump on that bandwagon. And I think the important thing and what makes this dangerous is those sophisticated investors that got in on the back are smart enough and sophisticated enough to know when to get out of the situation while the little guy is typically the one that gets, gets end up holding the bag. And that's very dangerous and sad. Tantalizingly, what could have happened is hedge funds taking aim at other hedge funds. This narrative that it was just Wall Street bets that moved it, I mean, a lot of other people think, uh, no, it must have been much bigger forces at play. Obviously, there was a short squeeze. Obviously, it could well have been hedge funds trying to screw over other hedge funds. Sure. Really? Absolutely. You, th you think other hedge funds were doing that, potentially? I mean, if you saw an opportunity to make money, it's, it's, it's legal, it's fair, go buy stock. It's an open market. What's without doubt is Wall Street bets helped to start things rolling. But much larger financial players were also heavily involved. People using Robinhood and people who are not large institutions or not registered financial professionals are a bigger part of the market than they've ever been. They're about a quarter, 25%. But they're still a small player relative to the biggest institutions. And so when you see a price movement from GameStop at $18 all the way up to $325, it's very unlikely that the only people that are buying and driving that price up are the retail traders just by virtue of their size in the marketplace. 
So what just happened? Was this something extraordinary? Did something change? And could it happen again? You're going to find that the large institutions have already made changes in their policies that pretty much prevent these extreme situations from happening. I would be certain that right now there is not a chat board out there that any hedge fund doesn't have their people in there in every single chat watching everything that's going on. Andrew Left says he'll think twice about shorting in the future. Did I lose money on GameStop? Yes. I took it, I move on. I'm, I'll have many good years ahead of me in the stock market, I hope. You don't think that what's happened will make people more nervous about shorting in the future? No, of course they will. No, no, of course. And as for GameStop, well, it's now looking to move its operations digitally. Its share price is still incredibly variable. In February, it's been between $40 and $200. Casper and Matt believe what happened shows what the internet can do through collective action. I think from now on, hedge funds are going to have in their risk models and prediction models, there's going to be a new line item in there like, hey, watch out for this, uh, like everyone ganging up on us and grouping together scenario. That's never happened before. That's without the internet, that would be impossible to accomplish that. John's investments was relatively small, but he lost most of it. I don't think any like change has come out of this. Um, that's been that's been pretty apparent. I hope people like see that. I hope everyone who gets screwed over uh, does see that no one's coming to bail them out and changes aren't being made to help the little guy. If if nothing else happens, I hope people get educated around that and just like learn a lesson. And Gavin says he ended up making forty thousand dollars. There is this kind of assumption that a lot of people who are on Wall Street bets were just there to like make a political point about hedge funds, but actually there were lots of retail investors that were there to make money. Like oh, you. yeah, no, definitely. Um, I would say, you know, as, as much as people say that they want to make a point about the hedge funds, at the end of the day, I, they, all, they all wanted to make some money. What's clear is that trading apps have transformed the financial system. Trading's become more democratic, but conversely, it's also become more risky, exaggerating the highs and the lows. The story of GameStop then is both inspirational and cautionary. If this was a revolution, it was one that had its casualties of some investors who reached for the moon and didn't quite make it.